welcome. Today I'm here with Gaj Ravichandra. Welcome, Gaj. Thank you, Karen. Great to be here. No, I was really excited when I got your um, email about coming on the uh, podcast because you're a registered psychologist, you've got a Master of Commerce, you're a mental toughness trainer and facilitator and career and executive coach, which just, I just went, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have a good time here. <laughs> I really loved about reading about you was that you say you want to live your life so you leave a trail of happiness behind you, which I just thought was amazing. <laughs> yeah, look, I think um, it would be inept of me, you know, going around and, and talking to people and, and having sessions with people um, around purpose and, and, and why we're here without having my own very clear purpose, right, of what, what I'm trying to achieve. And I think for me, I've always been a people pleaser. And I think, you know, when they say, Karen, <laughs> put your hands up, when they say that um, you should lean into your strengths, right, and I think there's a real sense of value around that with a caveat, right, which is you also need to protect yourself, you know, through that process. And, you know, I think sometimes finding your boundaries and setting your boundaries as you get older and older it may be wiser. I'm not sure there's a direct correlation always with, with age and, and wisdom, but I, I'd like to say that, particularly when I talk to my kids, um, is that you want to be able to set up an environment where you can feel comfortable and safe, right, to be able to leave um, some goodness behind you as you as you walk through this life. And I think each of us bring so much amazing uh, strengths and character, right, to this uh, to this life. And I think it's about how do we encapsulate that and use that in a way that is helpful um, to others around us. It's, I want to pick up on this people please mm. of being a strength bit because one of the issues I think we have, I mean, as we get older, from my personal experience I'm talking, we become more self-accepting. We just come, look, I can't do that, but I can do that and, you know, okay. But there are certain things we are very judgmental about our strengths and weaknesses. And yeah. people pleasing isn't generally seen as a strength. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not, is it? It's in fact, it's something that we we talk about publicly as something that can be quite detrimental, you know, to us. And I think it can be if you don't have those boundaries set up. But isn't there something wonderful about being able to leave a podcast? or a conversation with someone, and someone walks away feeling amazing, right, or feeling like they've had just a wonderful conversation or discussion. And I'm sure you and I are going to have this feeling today, right? And I'm hoping your audience gets to have that experience when they listen to your podcast, right? That is actually, in a lot of ways, for me, what I'm, I'm talking about with people pleasing. You're, you're leaving a trail where the engagement or the interaction you have with people is so positive that they are better off for that experience. Right. And so for me, I love the fact that I can look at someone's face when they're, you know, finished a session with me and they feel better about themselves or the situation that they're in, that they have a path in which they can move forward on what was a challenge when they came into that session. Right. And so that, that idea for me has always been wonderful. And of course, you need to have boundaries. I think we need to set up boundaries in all aspects of our life as we go through changes, depending on, you know, where we are in our life. But I think the idea that we should lose this ability or willingness to also bring happiness to other people, please other people, doesn't need to come at the cost of our own happiness, right? I think those two can coexist. If we think about these Venn diagrams, right, they kind of overlap. I think we can coexist in that world. Um, they don't need to be two separate entities. Uh, so that's my philosophy anyway. No, it's a really good point because I can see what you're saying about if you put the boundaries in place and it's not necessarily a negative way of mm. being. It It's just what interested me was the judgment on it and then you saying, no, I'm actually taking advantage of that um, yeah. strength of mine. Um, that I found really it's like, oh, that really lightened me up. It was like, oh, okay, so... The things that I perceive or I think society perceives as being negative might actually be my strength and mm. I can use that. How do I use? Because I know when I was having a really rough one about 10 years ago, mm. the thought that kept me going was the universe only made one of me. I am the way I am because the universe wants to experience itself 
through me. And that kind Beautiful. of had me start accepting. I open my mouth and stuff just comes out. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows where they stand with me. But I like to have a laugh and all these other things. But it was difficult. I'm not subtle at all. Mm-hmm. Can't mm-hmm. do subtlety to save my life. <laughs> I'm like a bull in a china shop. I've got a short temper sometimes. You know, it's it was a difficult journey for me. And I think it is for a lot of people accepting those things. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I love what you just said, that the universe sort of lives through you, right? And and it, this is something that, you know, I, I'm a massive believer in, that nowhere in the history of mankind has there ever been a Karen like you, right, or a person like you. There will never be a person like you who has had the combination of your thoughts, your feelings, your behavior, your ancestral inheritance, all these wonderful things, right? We take the good and the bad, right, with any of these things and try and work, make sense of it for ourselves. But the fact that you are so unique, the fact that you have brought this immense um, and complex uh, combination of things together means that we need to see this, right? And we need to see it. And I think where we don't want to express ourselves clearly comes from insecurity or fear, right? And so if we manage that, the, the uncertainty, right, of are people going to accept me for who I am? Are they going to be able to understand who I am? And I think in any of those situations, you know, from my perspective, it's really, it's a two-way conversation, right? There's an onus and responsibility on us to be able to express ourselves so that people can understand us. And there is an onus and responsibility on the receiver of that information, right, to also do that. Now, we can't control the receiver. And it goes back to this point of, if we were to control the controllables, right? What's in my control here? What's in my control is how I come across, how I pass on this information and knowledge um, to this person at this time based on where they are at, right? Uh, to the best of my knowledge. Um, so I think that's beautiful. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna use that line that you've just uh, given. Is that is that uh, trademarked or can we uh, can oh, we can we? I that? need a copyright payment on each use. <laughs> <laughs> I just. For me, it just gave me permission and to start to think that it was okay to be me. That was, and that was what I struggled with for a long time. Mm -hmm. I think so. And I think, you know, we all go through this and this is a lot of self-doubt, whether we call it imposter syndrome or various other things that that creep into ourselves. And and I think a lot of that, you know, when I do talk to people and when we look at the fact that most high performers are highly capable people you know, over 70% will will struggle with this, right, throughout their lives. And part of that is around, I think, am I going to please other people? Am I actually going to be accepted in some way, right? Am I going to lose my place um, where I am in society as a result of me verbalizing or acting in a particular way, right? And we've talked, you know, we've seen the cancel culture, we've seen other things come up that really do put sometimes a, a bit of a break on who we might be and how we might express ourselves. And not necessarily to the point where we are offending other people, but at least to have some freedom, right, in terms of how we communicate. And so I think there's a, it's really interesting when when we go through this, because for me, you know, it's also about reconnecting with, you know, who we are, you know, from a genuine perspective, right? If I'm going to be consistent in my behavior, um, I'm more than likely going to be more truer to myself. Right. And so that requires less cognitive energy. Right. Because otherwise you're you're creating structures in your mind to filter, filter, filter who I am as a person. And that requires a lot of energy. And so where is our energy better spent? Is it better spent on trying to filter, filter, filter? Or is it about finding ways of expressing and connecting with people, right? That are going to get some value um, from what it is that we do. Um, so I think that that's always been interesting to me and how people do that and how they choose to find, if you like, their tribe and their connection point. Um, you know, you and I were talking off air just before this podcast about, you know, you moving from, you know, blogging into podcasting and, you know, how you've helped so many people through this process, right, of, of you sharing your story and also connecting with other people. What a wonderful way that you found to do that. Now, imagine if you'd filtered that down to, well, actually, I think I might only be communicating with a very small portion of the population here who actually want to talk about this, right? 
Yeah, that that's actually a really good point because my goal in this is never it's never been the numbers. Mm. It's always been about well, if I can contribute to her and her and him. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and you don't know how it's going to be received, right? We can't control that, right? No. And I think so what you've done, you know, beautifully carries you've taken control of what you can control. And so therefore you put it out to the world and those who will connect with it will find value from that, right? And I think that's a that's a wonderful thing. Um, it's a gift actually. And in a lot of ways, this is how you're leaving a trail of happiness behind you. No, I've been dragged a few times into the numbers game. I have been dragged into and it's like, I don't like it. I just yeah. it just feels fake and off to me. So I just happily meander along and talk to the people I want to talk to and put out a podcast. That is literally all I do. <laughs> There's no in order to. I, uh, that's it. I've taken the in order to out of it because mm-hmm. I don't work well. Some people work well in order to when they do in order to. For me, it's just completely out of alignment. And I think knowing what works for you and being okay with what works for you mm-hmm. has been the key for me. Mm. personally yeah absolutely and I think that sense of that requires self-awareness mm. right and so you know going through a process of actually understanding where you are and, and you know you're a different person at different points of your life and to assume that I'm the same person I was three years ago is a bit of a fallacy right and so you know we need to work through this constant uh, way of, of looking at how we uh, interact with people um, what gives us happiness and enjoyment and fulfillment. Um, and I think a lot of that comes down to really understanding what are we driven by, you know, externally and internally, and that that changes over time. Our values, you know, what is important to us, that's, you know, less less likely to change over time. Sometimes the the priority of the things that we value might shift, obviously, depending on where we are in our lives. And then this sense of, our motivated skills, right? The the cross or the intersection between what we're good at and what we enjoy doing. And when we understand those things, um, that also makes it much easier for us to have a greater impact on the purposes that we want to have. And one of the th- things that always frustrates me when I hear people talk about purpose is that we're not here for one thing, right? There's not one magical purpose that we are here to deliver on, right? It doesn't exist. And I'm if you can help me on this, I'm trying to understand what is the plural of purpose. Is it purpi? Can we create a word? I don't know what yeah, it let's is. create that one. That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if we have purpi or purposes, I don't know. Whatever that is, we you know we need to firstly understand our internal state, right? Before we start worrying about our external state, because we might say, "Look, my purpose is to end world hunger." Right? That's one of my purposes. Right? But what if I have zero interest in the things that are required to solve world hunger, right? And it may not be because I don't want to do it. It's just that my strengths, my motivation, my drive are not necessarily aligned to those things. It could be other things that I need to do, right? So sometimes I think we start with the end in mind, but they that might not be always the best place to commence this journey, right, as we conduct that self-awareness. Does that make sense? It's actually a really good point because it was something I struggled with. That thing about purpose, so many people used to say to me, you need to find a purpose in life. And I spent several years going, holy cow, I haven't got a purpose. What could my purpose be? Um, Well, I like that, but I don't want to do exactly what you said. I don't want to do that, that, that to get that. Oh, my God, I'm really good at communicating very difficult ideas in very simple ways, but I don't want to be a teacher. There was all these things, and so I was left, but probably six years going, what is wrong with me? I don't know what my purpose is. And to this day, I don't know what my purpose is other than I like sharing information. (laughs) Which is fantastic, right? And so that's a great example of these motivated skills, right? So you've gone internal and said, well, what do I enjoy doing? And it's a bit like in, in mathematics, in maths, we have this thing, you know, chaos theory, right? That you have these what seem like a random series of events or things that happen um, but a mathematician will say, well, I'll find a formula or an algorithm that connects those things, that makes sense of these things, right? And this is what happens in our life. You know, we sometimes go through different stages in our life that we where we need to connect the dots. And when we start to connect the dots, 
meaning comes out of it naturally, right? But we first start to identify what are those dots? What are those connection points? What did I extract from that that was perhaps meaningful to me, right? And then what were some of the outcomes, you know, from those uh, particular events or, or opportunities in our life? And when we start to do that, magic really does take place. Um, and we start to see people having these sort of aha moments where they thought something that they thought was important to them 18 years ago, right? An achievement that they had, they thought had no role to play in their lives anymore, right? And then when you dissect it, you start to see, well, what are the elements of this, right? That sit there that are true to you. All of a sudden, this formula starts to come to life, right? And so, yes, it may look different, but the elements or the the you know the, the the core components right of that you will see a pattern throughout your life it's not an accident right and so you know it's a beautiful sense of you know going back to your point that self awareness right we we need to create this for ourselves and we need to make time for us to do this i think a lot of us don't make time right um, to sort of uh, you know understand what is actually important to us the other thing is, in talking in that scenario, is the things that we find easy, we tend to place no value on yes. because they're easy. And then the other thing we throw into the mix is, well, how do I make money out of that? Yeah, yeah. How do we monetize? I've got to live, right? I've got to pay the bills and, and you know have a wonderful lifestyle as well. Absolutely. Um, and I think there's, you know, those are almost two separate skill sets, right? I, I find it really interesting you know, I've met so many people um, across my life and, and, and the nature of my work. Um, you know, I'm, I'm coaching four billionaires at the moment, right? And so what's interesting with them is that, yes, they might have, you know, accumulated significant success, you know, commercially, but a lot of them struggle with finding out what they're meant to be doing because there's an element of they've achieved something, right, up to this point. They've built a community. They've built a an industry or a company. And sometimes those companies have tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of employees. And then what do you do, right? Because that might have been a goal that you you had as a tick box, right? And a lot of them will have other, and they're highly driven people, right? They have a lot of those you know, high risk taking and highly ambitious. They have that in common, right? So I'm meant to stop now that I've done this? Or what else is there in it for me, right? And this is where you find a lot of these foundations, you know, um, get generated, you know, all of a sudden, because people have lost a connection with what they originally were trying to build, right? And so that, that other meaning or purpose tends to come up in their life. Um, we don't start with a, a charitable foundation first, right? That doesn't tend to happen before people have gone and done this. You can do that, right? There's nothing stopping people from doing that. Um, but it's interesting how it happens the other way around. Yeah, I think going back to that idea of self-awareness, that idea of connection and belonging, finding your your posse, your tribe, right, is really helpful to do a lot of things. And part of that, uh, and we spoke about this before, was around how do how does that actually affect our physiology, right? Because that we know that social constructs around us, the the, the dynamism of of being in a social environment uh, actually changes our hormone levels. It changes the physiology of our behavior. And so, you know, by connecting to things, you naturally increase your levels of serotonin and estrogen in your body, right? You can actually manipulate um, that. And it may not be to the extent, obviously, um, that you might have had in the past, right? But everything contributes. And so I think that's why social connection is so important. All right. Um, and I want to talk more about that because mm. I've got a, an interesting situation at the moment. My youngest daughter, she's got two choices in front of her. And one of them is to go to university with all the school friends. The other one is to do this job that's going to give her a lot of great experience and to go to university completely away from everybody part time. Mm. Personally? After looking at what she's gone through this year, I'm like, go to uni with your friends. Just give yourself 12 yeah. months to get back on your feet and then decide what you're going to do. Because mm. I see the going, doing this job that's going to give her all this experience and stuff. I don't see that. While it'll give a beneficial experience, I think she actually needs the social side of things in order to mm. make a decision. So it's my instinct is telling me what mm. you've just said how yeah. important is that the social side of things to being 
to feeling, to being able to make a decision that's in alignment with what's important to you? Yeah, so finding some time, and we've, we've seen this a lot with, um, you know, individuals who are finishing school or university, they, you know, the first time in the longest time we have seen, um, you know, students deselecting out of going and joining a corporate entity and perhaps going and setting up their own entities or, you know, startups and so forth. Yeah. And I think part of that is around, yes, excitement. Um, you know, we've obviously seen some individuals have some success, you know, from doing that. It's a very small proportion, obviously, of the population. But there's an excitement, right, that comes from that. But whenever you talk to these individuals who go off and do, you know, these kind of jobs early on in their life, one of the things they talk about consistently is the camaraderie that they had with the people around them, right? That they were on a mission, not just by themselves, but with a group of people, right? And that group of people is what catapulted them, right, into this next level of uh, success, whatever that might look like. So I would say, you know, with your daughter, it's probably a sense of having that awareness first of what is important to her. And perhaps what's important to her may may be different to you. Right. And so that sense of understanding what that is and, and what she's going to gain from that. Maybe there are other avenues for her to be able to get that social contact or that sense of belonging as well. Maybe there's a sense of purpose that's driving her that she can see if she uses her skills, her interests, uh, her values in some way that she is going to contribute. Right. Now, that sense of contribution gives you a sense of belonging right, as well. And that looks different to each of us. So, you know, sometimes the father in me kind of wants to say, you know what, darling, take both options. Why don't you do a hybrid, right? Do some university and do this job and kind of just be safe, right? That's the protector in me kind of talking, right? But I guess in a lot of ways, what we want to do is we don't want to drive them because of insecurity or fear, right? We want to kind of give them the choice to, to do that. And she's early on in her life where even if something goes wrong, she can always jump back into study, right? What's the worst case scenario, right? That's going to take place in, you know, 12 months, for example. And I think that sense of that rush that we find, right, to kind of get things done, you know, we're caught up in this constant zone of doing that. And that that beautiful research that was done, you know, a little while ago now that that talked about you know, when you go from school to, if you choose, you know, extra tertiary education, jumping straight into university, for example, is not as effective unless uh, compared to taking a gap year where you have some structured learning, right? So if you take that 12 months and you have through that 12 months, you don't have to work the entire 12 months, but say six months of that is some structured learning and some opportunity to, to help other people, you are significantly advantaged over those people who have gone straight into university, right? In your life, right? It has a massive impact in your life. And so there's something of value there about being able to break from that routine a little bit with a little bit of structure that can help um, as well. Where is your daughter coming from in that instance? What's sort of driving her, do you think? So what happened was she went straight to university from school. She got into Fabulous university, the top women's college in Australia, and hated it with a passion and Mm. left after six months. Mm. And most of her friends had taken a gap year from school. So she then came home, um, and that was when she decided she really didn't want to go back. And she kind of bimbled about, now we've moved house from where she went to school, so she's away from all the school friends. So she's got no support network around her Mm. and then she decided she was going to go to university because we used to live in Armadale New South Mm. Wales and that was where she went to school so now she then she decided she was going to go to university in Armadale do a course that she's so suited for and then she went she got this job as an internship because her sister works there in marketing and she's like oh no maybe I can do this because I want to learn she doesn't enjoy the profession that it's in she doesn't really want to do this Mm. long term she just feels like I think her boss she's acting as a boss's executive assistant and she's organizing Mm. everything and she's enjoying organizing everything and I reckon three months tops and she'll be heartily sick of it (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> and she's tempted by the money, which is also a big alarm bell as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she doesn't have a friendship circle around here. She doesn't drink. She doesn't party. So mm. the company she's in, online marketing company, they're all party animals, including her sister. And yeah. they go out drinking and she's getting pressure to go out and drink with them, but she's the sober one. And then so there's a lot of things that are. What I can do, I'll, I'll email you this uh, values and motivation questionnaire you can pass on to her, which might be helpful Please. sort of yeah. identifying that because we know that if if she has greater alignment, right, with the things that are important to her, then it might actually help. And sometimes when you see it, right, and you, this is what's important to me, this is what's available to me, there's no crossover happening here, then perhaps it's not going to be a great fit, right? And so sometimes we need to see it. We need the visual cue. And I, I know what it's like. I'm trying to, you know, if I try and tell my daughters things that they need to do, they're not interested in what I've got to say. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> but sometimes it's got to be objective, right? Because it, it, it might be laced with some emotionality, right, That that is natural, right, that's going to be there. And so I think... The more objective, you know, that we can try and be with them, sometimes that can be helpful as well. Um, I'm sure you've had, you know, that you've had many years of practice of doing that, right? Which is great. Um, so I'm sure you're much more advanced than I am in that. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that, but I just have had more, I've had experience at it. It was interesting last night that we actually got to the bottom of she does things like when she went to university last year because it looks good. Mm. Mm. And that's the same with this job. It's going to look good if she can say she's been an executive assistant to a guy who owns a marketing company. Yes. She went on um, exchange when she was 16, 15 or 16 to Colombia for three months, right? Wow. Which she didn't speak Spanish. (laughs) She was sitting at the dining table and the family who were fabulous were all be talking in Spanish and she enjoyed herself. But. It was very, very difficult because she did feel very isolated. Mm. I had a fabulous time at the same time, but there were the negatives and the positives, you know. Yeah, yeah. Good, but it looks good on a resume. That's my. That's where my hesitation is coming from because she's doing it for the same reasons that she went to the university. She went to Columbia. And it's because it looks good, you know, and I'm like, yeah, maybe we could reassess that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I guess finding a balance, right? And, and, and you know, you can, you can almost see some other little interesting patterns there just in those two stories, right? That sense of adventure, perhaps a bit of risk taking, yes. yes. um, you know, those kind of things are there, a bit of variety. Yes. So you, 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 as we start to see those dots coming up, it might be, well, how does she get that in an environment like a university? right, where you can see where there's going to be a disconnect because she's not going to necessarily get those things unless she's perhaps doing a course that might be challenging, right, for her or she's actually in an environment that is perhaps there's so much variety and options to meet different kinds of people and connect with different people, perhaps in a different kind of city um, or context, right? Uh, Um, Different country. She wants to go to the UK, so she applied for the UK and then oh, we've had so many changes in the last six months. <laughs> she asked me what Keely's doing. I'm like, well, this week. <laughs> but my concern is that she doesn't actually, and I think this is where I was coming from with the initial question, she doesn't value social connections. Mm. And I've begun to understand over the last 10 years probably just how important they are and when they're not there, you don't realise necessarily what a missing they are. I think yeah. that's where I'm coming from with all of this, with the concern. That's the underlying concern is that if she goes to university in Armadale, to me it is it is about what you said, raising the dopamine levels, raising the estrogen levels. I said to her, it doesn't matter. You can leave in 12 months but yeah. have a good time and get back on your feet emotionally and yeah. then decide what you want to do because my instinct as a mother tells me she's not in the right space and she doesn't have the connections to support the decision. That was actually what I said to her last night. You, you've not got yeah. the connections to support your decision right now, um, yeah. especially. You haven't got that support network. So that Absolutely. was where I was coming from. I got It was a really long-winded way of getting to the point there. <laughs> no, it's awesome. I, I look, I think it's it's also important for her to hear that, right, from you, that that is actually the concern. It's not about, you know, her choosing what she wants to do. It's also about just having that sense of 
support and connection around her, right? And we know how valuable that is. And we, we call these the social supplements, right, of our life. So we need to have that around us so that we can feel that we are energized and boosted by what we do. You know, in social psychology, we, we call this a uh, social identity theory, right? So the, the theory is that we are at our best when we tend to feel that we are part of something. You know, when you look at these mass shootings, um, you know, in the US, and, and one of the common factors that comes up, uh, and I'm not liking this to your daughter by any stretch of the imagination, um, but there is a common theme, which is those individuals who go and commit these horrendous acts of violence would never do that if they felt a connection to that community, right? And so when you don't have that connection, you are capable of doing things that, you know, you may not necessarily believe that you should be doing. And so, you know, creating that sense of community, fostering that sense of connection, identifying yourself with some sort of social group has much more of a positive impact on us than we can, you know, sort of consciously, uh, you know, sort of manage and, and sort of understand. Um, and so I guess that sense of who can she connect with? Who does she connect with? Who are her support base, you know, right now? Um, you know, who's her tribe, right, that she can kind of lean on? Um, at the moment. And so she might have some answers for that, right, around what that might look like, um, and perhaps finding a compromise, right, around that as well, um, which is interesting. So, yeah, I'll, I'll send that values and motivation questionnaire to you, Karen. She might, she might get some value from connecting with that. Right? Yeah, no, that'd be lovely. Right. So where are we going to go now? Talk to me about the kind of work you do in companies, because I know you was one of the things that attracted me on the website was you were talking about when people are underperforming. And oh, this is a good one. I remember I was reading the other week that a couple of companies have just gone to four day weeks after sitting down with their employees and going, look, you can do your work in four days. We'll do four day weeks on a permanent basis. Yeah. I think it's amazing. I think we'll get down to three days, actually. Mm. Um, and, and part of that is because of something that's happening right now. It's this, it's this fractional employment world, right, that we are moving into. And already 20% of the US are doing this. So it's the idea that we will no longer be just working for one employer. We will have multiple employers that we'll work with at any given time. Um, and probably the equivalent of two part-time jobs, if you like. Right. And so in the US, this is already happening. It's going to move across and it will be impacting us more and more. And so the idea that, you know, we're going to shift from five days to four days, four days probably to three days, and that that will open up an opportunity for us to then think about other things that we should be doing um, to fill that gap, if you like, because our salaries unfortunately aren't going to stay at five days. They'll be dropping as well, potentially. You know, there's, great opportunity um, to be able to build some of this for ourselves. Now, that presents some interesting challenges and opportunities, right? And I, when I talk about this with people, uh, some people start flipping out because they get a bit nervous about what that might mean, right? The idea that, what, what do you mean I have to be employed by multiple people? Well, actually, it's your brand and you get to manage your brand the way that you want, all right? That's, that's one way of looking at it. And so if you want to give time and put a value on your time and knowledge and expertise and be able to go out to the market and say, hey, I can probably do this for about two and a half, three days a week, and I can probably do this over here for, for two and a half, two days a week, then it's actually going to give you a few things. One is increased social access, right? Because you're going to be you know, doubling the amount of people that you're probably exposed to. You're going to be able to get a lot of variety in the work that you do, more variety. It's a uh, you're minimizing your risk by doing this, right? Instead of putting all your eggs in one basket, you're actually then starting to look at diversifying, right? Where your income streams and opportunities are. But it also means that we need to manage our brands, our personal brands, more differently to what we're doing right now. So the idea that I can be in a chair and I can just put my head down and work in that job. Um, and be left alone, we know is not a good strategy for, for the time that we live in, right? I mean, look, think about all these jobs in the tech world that are being let go. I mean, these are highly capable individuals working in some of the top companies in the world, losing their jobs, tens of thousands of people over the last couple of months. Where are all these people going to go in a market where people are not hiring so much, right? More than likely, 
they'll be re-employed, perhaps on a part-time basis, or they might set up their own ventures, right? And so, you know, we start to see more creativity coming back into the markets and the opportunities for that. Um, I mean, I can't tell you how many men and women that I'm talking to at the moment who are in their sort of late 40s to, you know, late 50s who are saying, you know what, I don't want to do what I've been doing for the last 20 odd years of my life. I need a change. And I want to take back control of where I am because I can see how fragile the world is right now and things are changing. And so the idea that we are moving to four days a week is not surprising. I think in New Zealand, I think they're going going to put it into law or something, right? I think they're they're really starting to get. I can't remember exactly what it is, but yeah, it's it's a big thing in New Zealand. They've been trying, yeah. So we will move to three days. It's only a matter of time, Um, and companies will also see that as an opportunity, you know, to reduce cost. But what that also means is it frees us up to then think about what else we can be doing. So maybe we can work for a corporate, but maybe we can have an entrepreneurial sort of uh, opportunity or business as well, right? That that might come into that. So all of that stems back to having that self-awareness as well and, and knowing what is important to us and what we want to achieve. Um, so I'm really excited about this. I, I think it's great. But I think like, even my husband, he just goes, he's a property developer mm. and his architects during COVID, they all started working from home, obviously. Mm. He hates it. Yeah, he hates it with a passion because he wants to know that his architects are in the office when he <laughs> needs them. Yes, yes. <laughs> so there's, there is a resistance to that, and I think this the new way that things are going is you've got to be willing to embrace change. I think mm. and be able to. It's not going to necessarily be predictable, but one of our things that drives us is predictability, isn't it? We like to be we like things to be predictable, so Absolutely. we know where we're going. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think we live in this world. You know, everyone talks about this VUCA world, right? That sort of volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous world that we live in. And the latest acronym that uh, you know these business schools uh, have created is that living in this VUCA world has. Uh, means that we are what we call bani, B-A-N-I. We are brittle, so we're fragile, much more fragile than we used to be. We're a lot more anxious, right, because it's so hard to predict what's going to happen, and therefore that sense of uncertainty raises our anxiety levels, right, about what, what's going on. It's also non-linear, which means if I used to do X, Y, Z, I know that I was going to get to this point. Well, that isn't necessarily the case anymore. Right. And so I can't predict what's going to happen. I can't just act in a linear way. Right. And then the last part is incomprehensible, which means that there are a lot of things out of our control. And so, you know, a lot of the problems I think, Karen, stem from the fact that we are trying to control things that we can't. And so, as a result of that, bringing that conversation back in and saying, right, what are the three or four things right now that I can influence and control quite strongly? And how do I lean into those things um, to be able to get the best outcome, right? So, for example, for you, you know, going from blogging to podcasting, right, it's wonderful that, you know, you are being able to take that skill set and then be able to get this beautiful knowledge out to the world, right, for people to access. So, all of a sudden, you might have gone from, you know, blogging or having a, a you know, sort of a, a role here in the Gold Coast in, in Australia to now someone in the corner of Colombia is going to be able to find you and listen and resonate, right, with the content that you have. And therefore, the scale of our impact has changed. And so the opportunity, therefore, increases, right, for what we do. And that's exciting, but it's also scary at the same time. And so I think, you know, that incomprehensibility part uh, is interesting. But I, most people I talk to feel pretty brittle and anxious right now. I think it's a very natural feeling based on what's happening in the world. I mean, I suppose the younger generations are going to have an easier time of learning how to cope with this Mm. kind of scenario than the people like, you know, I'm the tail end of the where you were expected to leave school and get a job and stay in the job. Well, that was before my time, but, you know, you stay in the job until you retire. Yeah. And there's still a few, I mean, to me, a lot of the corporate world is still in that thing that, you know, this is the way we do it and you come and sit at your desk and you. 
And I think the younger generation, they're much better at saying no. I mean, you and I know this with kids. So, I mean, they're, they're much more astute and capable of setting some boundaries for themselves. You know, I was talking to a friend who's a cardiologist the other day, and he said, you know, one of the interesting things is that we've seen life expectancy increasing, right, over the years. Probably our generation is going to be the first where it drops, right? Something has happened where the levels of stress that we have now taken on board just haven't been able to cope with the level of medical um, in- enhancement, right, that has taken place. Now, this might be the first time generationally where this is going to happen. Right? Our parents' generation actually were very quite very resilient, but they might not have had the same level of stress and anxiety, right? And so I, th- I found that really fascinating. And when I look around, I see a number of people having heart issues in their 40s and 50s, right, um, which typically didn't happen in the past, right? I mean, people were kind of, you know, being able to extend their life and, and, and live beyond that. And stress has a massive impact on that. And so we're definitely seeing that being an issue right now, um, you know, for people. So I was quite shocked uh, by that sort of trend um, that we're seeing. So to avoid all this, what, what can we do? Uh, and I think that's where one of the challenges is, right, is how do we then bring back that sense of enjoyment and alignment and fulfillment to the work that we're in? And so understanding what those things are, firstly, and then finding out some options to do that. Um, you know, knowledge is ubiquitous, right? We, we can You can access career coaching stuff everywhere. You can access psychologists or therapists. You can access counselors. You've got access to people um, like never before, um, you know, in terms of being able to get that support. Um, so I think there are great opportunities to do that. Um, and it's just about being honest with ourselves you know, as we go through this process uh, and understanding what is important to us. Something that comes up for me as you're saying that is when you meet people, one of the questions, one of the first questions they say is, what do you do? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so immediately you get put in this little box. Yes. And what do you say to people? What do I do? Well, I do that and then I do that and then I've got this. And I think that's being not being able to define ourselves is is a challenge for a lot yeah. of people, you know? So you, you'll hate this next question that I ask. Uh, so in sessions, um, so because we are naturally inclined, right? We're programmed to ask that question. What do you do? I ask, who are you? Yeah. Right. That is just infinitely difficult for people to to kind of grapple with, and even for me to kind of if I sat down and you would ask me that question, I would naturally be drawn to certain parts of my life, maybe certain achievements, things that have resonated with me that might actually, you know, indicate the kind of person that I am, right? You know, I think we do need to shift the conversation a little bit, right, from what we do to a much more broader conversation of who we are as people. And therefore, what does that bring to the table, right? Yes, I might have been an accountant for 30 years or 25 years, but there's plenty of other things that contribute to me being a successful accountant, right? And we break those things down, we can apply those skills and that knowledge into so many aspects of our lives, right? And I think it's it's something that, you know, I see a lot of people who are 35-year-old to 40-year-old accountants who are struggling with this, right? Because they're good at stuff, but they may not be passionate, right? Or enjoy what they're doing. And so you tend to find a lot of them in business schools trying to find an answer, um, you know, to life. Um, you know, they'll hop, they'll, you start, they go through a series, you'll see a phase in people's lives where they job change very quickly, Right, they might have been in a job for a period of time, and then every eighteen months they're kind of shifting, right? Because they just haven't reconnected with what they're looking for, and so it won't magically arrive. And so we do need to put that effort in to understanding that about ourselves. Yeah. It is because just when you ask that question, "Who are you?" What I noticed was that I wanted to define myself by things that I've done. Yeah, yeah. So, like, who are you then became, well, I'm a mother of four, um, but it was what I've done, not. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that was really interesting. I was yeah. Like, okay. And it's like, you know, very rarely, we, and I had this uh, individual, uh, wonderful female leader, um, entrepreneur, when I asked that question, she said, I am love. Wow. That's what I am. And everything that I do, I give myself through love to other people, th- to my employees to my customers, to my shareholders, to my husband, to my kids. That is who I am, right? 
And so, you know, that, that common thread of breaking down the, that outer shell of our achievements that we project to the world, right? That is our safety net, right? In lots of ways. Um, because people can understand that language of achievements. You know, we, we used to train to think that way, right? It's, it's, but all of a sudden we're relearning a language. And so then, you know, again, two people, you know, the giver and the receiver, we need to both understand that. So if you go to someone who only talks about what they do and you try to talk about who you are, there's a complete misalignment, right? I mean, this is why sometimes when we look at generational differences, we're coming from different angles, right? Maybe the younger generation are better at talking about who they are, right, rather than what they do. Um, and so, yeah, there's an element of that. Interesting because as you're talking again and I'm going, okay, so who am I? Mm. And then it's what I want to say is what is going to be judged well? who am i for you (laughs) are you gonna like what's best gonna move me ahead here it was really interesting the process that i went through and how confronting it is to go okay well i am yeah i don't know and it's a good point because i think we're using i guess the filters that make us comfortable right Mm -hmm. and so relearning sometimes how we might need to play around with those filters um, is important. So by asking, it's almost like a funnel, right? So at the broad top of that question, sometimes, you know, I'll I'll get a a whiteboard and just start writing down some of the content. When I ask that question of people, just give me the immediate words that come to mind. It's It's a word association task, right? And so you start with, I'm a mom, I'm a dad, I'm a son, I'm a, you know, whatever it might be. And then eventually it starts filtering down, right, into some core, core qualities, right, of who you are. And so that becomes really beautiful. It's a way of just channeling the conversation. And we can all do it ourselves. I mean, I don't know if you journal, but, you know, I sometimes do that myself. I don't journal every day. I might do it sort of twice a week now. But the the purpose of that is really to challenge and question a lot of maybe challenges or problems that I might have had during the week. Why were they a problem for me? How does it impact me as a person and how do I become a better person through that experience right it may have brought out the worst in me right in that particular moment but actually I need to bring the best of myself right to these situations and so I guess sometimes also it helps us to understand our triggers I had a friend the other day went through this values and motivation questionnaire asking this question of them and status you know worrying about what other people think of them was a really important value now, values, there's no right or wrong, right? It's just it's just what is important to you. And so being aware of that is the first thing, because then you can say, well, what decisions am I making in my life that are due to this value? And how is it serving me? Right? And it may be serving you, right? In some countries, having status means you can provide better for your family, right? And so it could serve you better. Uh, in other cultures, it may be less required. Right. And so I think sometimes just having that understanding, you know, can be really helpful. Yeah. Well, I went two places. And one is I remember when my eldest daughter was young and she was struggling a bit. So what we did was we sat down with her and on each piece of paper, she wrote out what was important to her. So it might just be happiness or smiles or something. And she pinned them all around the bedroom. She had about 10. Yeah. In the bedroom, and then she'd take them down and change them Fantastic. over the That's next amazing. few months. And that was just that was just fabulous. It was such. And a did cool you notice thing. anything about that? Were there sort of things that were happening that would then you would see her behavior change as a result of those things? Oh, without a doubt, because um, there was just stuff going on for her at school, and yeah. it just gave her the ability to handle things better in the classroom and yeah. with certain people in the class so it just changed it it kind of grounded her and made her feel protected I suppose made her feel safer fantastic she was, she was only about eight this- or nine at the time so actually she might have been younger than that so she didn't really understand it so it was words like kindness yeah and just the things that a seven or eight year old can understand but it was a really great way of and I can't take the credit for this. I got this idea out of a book. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. I mean, it's but phenomenal it's- at that age, right, to equip them with skills like that. Yeah. Right? yeah. And so it's, what's interesting there is that, you know, that, that cognitive cycle, you know, our thoughts affect our feelings, our feelings affect our behaviour. 
when those thoughts are repeated, right, they become beliefs. Mm. And so beliefs can change. We just need to change our the thoughts that we repeat to ourselves. And so your daughter there in that instance is probably looking around the room and she's, it's, she's channeling her thoughts, right, in some way, and they become the beliefs that she then acts on and she feels on and then acts on, right? Mm. So that's that's wonderful, actually. That's a great way of uh, sort of cementing and, and visually yeah. uh, another sense that is involved in that, right? Yeah. yeah, it was a big difference. We're going to mm. sign up off in a minute. I'm, we we run over time. We need to do another one. <laughs> yeah. um, just a, a bit of a funny story. I used to do a lot of work, I still do actually, with Landmark Education. And I remember mm. about 18 years ago, I was, might have been longer than that, I was doing the advanced course and they suggest that you take in a possibility for a way of being. So take yes. on a way of being into the course so that you can get the most out of it I took on the possibility of being vulnerable and I yes. couldn't even say the word <laughs> <laughs> I could not say it somebody had asked me what is the possibility of you creating up you create and I'd be going mm -hmm. <laughs> I literally could not say it it was really interesting <laughs> but and I think I've kept that through since then on and off but it's one of the Fantastic. things that I enjoy about these conversations because I'm no. happy to share. Yeah, and I think that that sharing requires that vulnerability, you know, from you. And it's, it can be quite draining, right, and intimidating when you are putting yourself out there. So it's a real credit to you, Karen. I think it's wonderful. I think um, as you were asking that question, I was thinking to myself, what is it that I'm probably, you know, as we come to the end of a year and thinking about the new year, you know, I, I think I, I need to bring in more curiosity. Um, into yeah. 2023 I think I'd like to do that more and more and find new ways of sort of you know being curious about different things in my life um, and the world I think uh, so thank you for that you've given me a wonderful uh, theme for me to think about and reflect yeah see a really good place to end because I think for me it'll be playful fantastic yeah I've got quite significant about certain things <laughs> <laughs> I do think and that's really it gets well. in the way gets in the way doesn't it yeah, I've been playful <laughs> fantastic and it's and it's the energy that that brings to other people as well right so which it is, is great. Yeah. yeah and the same with your curiosity thank yeah. you so much I really appreciate it it's been brilliant thank you Karen it was a free-flowing conversation I really enjoyed it and um yeah wish you all the best if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe so you're notified when a new episode is posted and rate and review this podcast and share it with your friends, please. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you're leaving with some great ideas that can make a difference in your everyday life. Until next time.